Hey everybody, just wanted to record this quick video for you guys and kind of give you some background information on what we're going to be doing when we get together in April for the fluids class. So as you can see on this opening slide, we've got Hurricane Ian there getting ready to cross over to Cuba. So we wanted to make sure we gave all respect due to the reason we didn't get together in the first place. So here we go. The landlock sessions. This is what today's conversation is going to be. We're going to talk about a couple of these bullet points, resistance versus restriction. Uh, we're going to get into questionology 101. Uh, we're going to talk about the stress response system. We're going to talk about the stress response poster, one of the posters that you guys received, and then the autonomic flexibility poster. That's the other one. So we're going to cover both of those when we get towards the end today. Okay, here we go. So when we're talking about resistance and restriction, we can take it to a physical model, like the image that you see here on the screen with a battery, a simple circuit, you know, and a light bulb. When we talk about restriction, restriction is going to be a, a physical barrier that keeps our body from reaching its optimal levels of homeostasis. A piece of resistance is going to be a little bit less of a physical restriction and more about the amount of depletion that it's causing. So think in terms of restriction being the frozen shoulder or the uh, particular physical malady, whatever patient that you're dealing with, versus a restriction is going to be sort of that, that low-grade, long-lasting inflammation that just kind of picks away at the body over time, never really recovering, never really necessarily getting in the way, but also stealing resources so that we don't actually get the chance to heal. So in this example, you can see a couple of different marks where red lines are on the circuits. And at the bottom right corner, you can see the life hammer that just kind of hits all of us. Uh, some life hammer marks are deeper. Some life hammer marks happen repeatedly. Uh, and some of them leave a little bit more damage than others. Uh, whether that is a restriction or a piece of resistance in the long run, it, they all end up dimming our light bulb, so to speak, as we refer to this example. So we're going to peel it off a little bit and do a little bit deeper of a dive into what this looks like. So when we're connecting with our clients and we want to connect with our clients and connect our clients with their resistance, uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, we open, we ask open-ended questions, uh, things along the lines of, does it have a color? Does it have a shape? Does it have a texture? And the it that I'm referring to in these questions is that piece of resistance or that, that issue where your client's tightness is, uh, any kind of piece of non-optimization in their body. Uh, is the starting spot and we can work our way down to being more specific as far as like where it is in the body what it feels like so we want to see if our if our people can give us that kind of information back so asking those open-ended questions it helps you understand where their thought process is where they're coming from and hopefully where they're going to head uh, one of my favorite questions to ask people um and we'll go through two different versions of it here, is when do you first recall this awareness? So how familiar are you with what's going on? So if somebody says they, is we're doing massage on their neck and shoulders and I touch, you know, the transverse process of C2 and I'm kind of working up here in their neck and they're like, wow, you know, that that's where my headaches come from. So a great question to follow that up with would be, when do you first recall getting headaches or how familiar are you with these headaches that lets you know how much of their life they're dedicating to dealing with or trying to avoid or medicating for those headaches and you can switch that headache out for low back pain endometriosis whatever whatever pathology you're dealing with at that point in time those kinds of questions are going to help you filter through the information a little bit so <clears throat> conversation starters. I would like to know more about your history of headaches, or I would like to know more about the relationship you have with your headaches. How often do you get them? How long do they last when they get really bad? What does that feel like? What has worked in the past to treat them? Things like that. Conversation starters. You want to help them 
feel comfortable sharing that information with you uh, at the beginning of your sessions and throughout your sessions and your time with each other so that you can help establish that rapport so that they can feel safe in your treatment room and safe in your hands and safe inside your therapy. Uh, can you tell me more about that? It's a great little quib. Um, and again, again, what, were, what is your relationship with this? If you feel the client feeling the restriction or your client's like, well, I can really feel that, Ask a question like, how does it feel to be in the presence of that? Or how does that pain feel to you? Is it a deterrent? Is it uh, something that stops you in your tracks? Again, develop more questions so that you can get a clearer picture of, is this something that is short-term treatable? Or is this something that's going to take some time because there are a lot of layers to it? So short-term treatable would be more of a restriction layers to and it's going to take a little bit more time is going to be resistance. Okay. Um, once you have connected with your client, I want you to work your way towards stillness and working your way towards stillness, whether you're dealing with restriction or release is, or restriction or resistance rather, sorry, uh, is going to lead you to release. Now, the stillness can be the still point, it can be a quiet moment, it can be anything that's in your skill set that helps just to let everything settle, right? It's usually that point in the treatment where conversation has kind of paused for a moment and their body's pulling you into a space. So I want you to sit in that space. And then as you feel things change in between your hands, then you can ask that open-ended question, what's changing for you? How does this feel compared to how it felt when we started? Right, get your patients and your clients plugged into how they feel and help them identify the difference between, <clears throat> excuse me, how they feel and how they felt. Okay, does that make sense? So when we go to the pictures on this particular slide, uh, restriction, we all know what it's like being stuck in traffic. There's nothing you can do about it. It just kind of is what it is. And you work your way through it, right? It's just, it's a, it's a barrier that's a physical space and it's holding you back. Now, when we slide over to the picture of resistance in that top right corner, uh, we've all kind of been there too. Hopefully you're not the person in the front um, being the Richard in this scenario, but when we're driving down the highway and somebody's in the left lane and they're not paying attention or they're just refusing to get over, that causes a backup way 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 behind them and that one backup you know it could last miles and lead to accidents and a various range of things but this is the same kind of thing in your body where it's not a stoppage of the body's ability to function but it becomes a hindrance right it becomes a resistance so in terms of electricity they call it an impedance so with this particular example of resistance in this picture should that person driving move over to the right, then all of those cars can go by and everything behind it gets to open up and it leads to resiliency, which is the picture at the bottom, which is an open highway. So in the body, it could be a low grade, long lasting inflammation of the ankles. It just, it always feels kind of wonky, but they just keep kind of doing their thing. And then over time, it ends up becoming knee pain or hip pain or headaches that that's when they come into our treatment room is they've got this headache and they've had this little piece of resistance all along. It's just been layered and layered and layered and layered and layered. And that becomes the physical restriction, which leads them to find us for help. So the idea here is to be able to slow down the noise of the day and the noise of the session to find that space of silence and stillness to help connect your people to what's going on and also help them recognize the change that's happening in real time. Which leads us to the uh, questionology schematic that I put together for you here. Because <clears throat> I know that not everybody is comfortable in therapeutic dialogue or uh, therapeutic conversation of how to steer the ship and do it from a position where we're not pushing them, but we're just opening the door for them, right? We're opening the door. They have to walk through the door. Them walking through the door is them giving feedback to the questions we're asking. So a question like who? 
identify who it is or who they are, meaning was there a person tied to this issue they're having? Maybe it's themselves, right? But identifying who it is, is one of those light bulbs that we just, we shine a little bit of light on whatever the darkness is, and it helps it to become a little bit less scary for them. So we move on down to questions like what, what are you doing? What is going on? Uh, if we're talking in terms of pain or uh, incredible sensation or awareness, right? Uh, stress, that's a big one as well. Um, what what are you doing when this pain occurs? What are you doing when this stress seems to go from manageable to overwhelming? What's going on? What's going on wrong? What's going on inside of you? What's going on around you? Right? Because as we do our manual therapy, when we ask these questions, we're going to feel the tissue change based on the responses they're giving. And this kind of helps us navigate are we moving towards where we're needing to go or are we moving away from it? Uh, another question could be, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you smell? When they find themselves in that moment of maybe if you're treating somebody who's surviving with PTSD, maybe they go into a flashback. Um, or even if it's just a general headache, what do they smell when they get a headache? Right? Sometimes headaches have smells. Um, what does the headache feel like? Because right? not all headaches are the same. Uh, not all low back pain is the same. So we ask questions that are open-ended to help help them articulate and illuminate what's going on in their life experience so that we connect it to what's going on inside their body. Uh, when, you know, this is a this is an important one because uh, trauma doesn't really have a timeline. Pain doesn't really have a timeline um, as to when it first showed up some people have blocked that out so a way to massage the conversation so to speak is when do you notice your issue showing up right so if we use we'll just stay in the same scene as headaches when do you notice your headaches is it the beginning of the month is it the end of the month if you're female is it around your cycle um when when does this show up and what makes it worse what makes it better right what time of day does it show up some of these things can help us identify maybe it, it might help us eliminate hormone swings or it might eliminate work-related stress or we might be able to identify maybe it's a hydration thing right we're not going to diagnose anybody but if we can help eliminate some of the variables to help illuminate some of the options, then we can walk our people forward and help them understand how their bodies function better, okay? Uh, where, obviously, where in your body do you notice this? If they're in the middle of a flashback, where are you? Uh, if it's a headache, where are you when the headaches show up, right? If your headaches only show up at work, well, maybe that's a thing. Um, and then when did this happen? When did this first start? Right, because a lot of times people who are surviving a traumatic experience blank out when it happened the first time, um, or they just avoid talking about when it happened. And if you notice that resistance coming from them is to your question, then give them permission to not answer it, right? No and I don't know or legitimate answers to any questions that somebody would have. So give them that option, okay? And then how, how does this feel? How, what do you notice, right? What you'll notice as you go through this schematic and you use it in your different pieces and, and figure out how you want it to work for you. There's a question that I left out on purpose and that's why. I have found in my years of practice that why becomes a very mental thing and tends to lead people away from paying attention to what's going on inside their body. So as somebody who is not a mental health counselor, I'm not concerned with why most of the time. I can get the answers to the questions that I'm looking for when I go through who, what, when, where, and how.
So on to the stress response system, right? So the stress response system, the stress response system is a concept that I've been working on for a couple of years as I've tried to figure out how to help the general public, right? If you're watching this video, you're a massage therapist and you're interested in what we do. A lot of you have already been through some of my training to begin with. Um, so the conversation with the general public becomes a little different because we have a different set of baseline information. So the stress response system is basically our body's ability to monitor our levels of safety. Are we safe or not? So if we use the hurricane example uh, with Hurricane Matthew, me, and Hurricane Nicole, my wife, um, this is actually hurricane season from 2016, so an actual image. Um, we see Hurricane Matthew making landfall in Florida and a little bit into Georgia, right? And we know that that hurricane is spinning counterclockwise as it hits the land. And the storm, the energy of the storm, when it makes landfall, it encounters restriction which is it no longer is over the water. It's no longer being fed by warm water. And the land masses, the hotels, the, the, the terra firma ends up becoming what tears the hurricane apart. So the restriction of terra firma becomes the resistance that rips the hurricane apart. But what we also want to pay attention to is this storm system that you can look up and see going from you know the northeast corner of Wisconsin all the way down through Texas it's going to play a role in how that hurricane uh, impacts the country as well. So when we think about our stress response system and how we function to the different stressors in our life, we want to take into consideration that sometimes our emotions and our stresses and the stressful things in our life will pass through us like a weather system passes through the country. So sometimes we got to endure a hurricane and get some help from some other storms in order to knock this thing back out to sea. So being in the hurricane isn't necessarily the bad thing as long as it's not a perpetual state. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so when we look at the stress response system and our ability to determine, are we safe? Are we not safe? What's the level of threat? Are we, are we at low levels? Are we at high levels? Are we at exhaustive levels, right? Um, we kind of have three radar systems that are working at all times. So image to the right, we have our exteroception. Right. So our exteroception is our spidey senses. This is what's going on around us. What's what's in our situation awareness. What are we getting that weird feeling? Are we getting a really good feeling? The things that we pay attention to as we navigate the world around us to help us determine which way to go in any given situation. OK. And that exteroception goes all the way up to just, you know, a cup, maybe like a half an inch off of your skin. Because once you get into about a half an inch of the skin, that's where the neuroception starts to pick up. And for me, the neuroception is sort of like the TSA of our body. It's just trying to make sure that no major threats get through. Because once those major threats get through, that's usually when damage occurs in the body. So that neuroception is literally the things that get on your nerves. So just things to pay attention to, and then go back through that conversation tree, the questionology tree of why is it why is it getting on my nerves? Oh, I don't know. Maybe that's not the best question. So how often does it get on my nerves? When it gets on my nerves, where in my body do I notice it? And then that question, where in my body do I notice it? That leads us to interoception, which is our ability to monitor what's going on inside of our body. Okay, so if I ask you, what does your spleen feel like today? You may not be able to answer, but if I ask you, how's your gut? How's your head? How you living? How you feeling? 
asking those kinds of questions gives you the ability to take a look inside and see what's going on. So interoception is also our ability to notice what changes during a massage. You know, do you, were your muscles tight? Now your muscles are soft. Were you dealing with some anxiety and after your treatment, your anxiety is gone. So that's interoception. So using that exteroception, that neuroception and interoception, those are the three radars that we have going at any given time to determine if we're safe or not. So the stress response system is meant to deal with real and perceived threats, right? Sometimes the threats that affect us are the ones that aren't real, but we build them up in our minds. That perceived threat, the in it, that perceived threat may be based in reality from previous experience, but it's not eminent <clears throat> in reality, okay? So our stress response system is meant to deal with these things, then recover right? We're meant to bounce back. So that question, are we safe or not, comes through when we're doing our body work and we're doing our massage through our touch. So this is where quality of touch matters, rapport matters, uh, your ability to connect with your patient matters. So then number two, the stress response system is constantly monitoring what's going on inside and outside of your body. Disruptions in flow of information cause inaccurate responses to the body, right? So if we have damage, right? We've incurred damage from the life hammer and that's caused some sort of physical distortion or some sort of guarding or piece of resistance inside of our body as information passes through that, our body, our brain is gonna get information that has received it's been received and it's run through the filter of damage. So if you think about that, uh, the game of telephone that we might have all played back in elementary school where, you know, person, student A gets told a message by the teacher. And by the time it goes all the way through the class to student Z, that message is completely changed. Our body works in the same way. Any information from our exteroception or neuroception as it gets processed by the body, if it's traveling through something that's guarded, or damaged, it's going to trigger a response that is based on previous experience, which is usually an overreaction versus the reaction being congruent with the actual system that's going on, right? So like, um, almost like an allergy, like a seasonal allergy, like oak pollen's not actively trying to kill you, but your body thinks it is, so it responds with inflammation and snot and mucus and all of the fun things, okay? So what we do through our body work is help to reduce and eliminate some of those disruptions in the information flow. We clean it up a little bit, optimize the body's ability to communicate with itself and within itself so that we can help homeostasis take a bigger, well, bigger, bigger hold, okay? Um, the stress response system is resilient. Again, it's meant to recover. So our three metrics that we look at when we look at the stress response system are frequency, depth, and duration. So frequency can be looked at through a couple of different lenses. Frequency might be how often did this occur? Was it a single car accident that caused an issue? Or was this um, you know, a case of bullying where it just happened a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot? Right, so <clears throat> based on frequency, you can see how the impact would be different. And then, you know, frequency could also be in terms of megahertz. You know, was it a was it a, a chemical thing that really shook you to your core? Right, like um, you know, maybe somebody was drugged, or somebody, you know, tried a cigarette for the first time, or. Um, you're in a situation where you don't really like the feeling from the people that you're around, right? That's a, that's a frequency thing. Like it's not harmonic for you. So you decide to dip. Okay. Uh, duration is how long did it last, right? How long did this real or perceived stressor impact your life? Okay. And then depth, depth could be, again, two different things, kind of like frequency. Depth could be how physically deep did it go into your body? You know, was it a paper cut? 
or did you have an organ removed? Um, it could also be, is this very superficial or is this very complex, like a, a, an adverse childhood event with no real coping skills because of the age of the trauma? And it just becomes layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of adaptation and survival mode. So when we look at the stress response system, we want to keep in mind those three pieces, exteroception, neuroception, and interoception. And it allows us to figure out, do we need to, do we need to guard? Do we need to put our walls up? Or are we safe? Can we let go? Can we decompress? Can we heal? And then we look at when we're dealing with uh, the human beings that we're dealing with, you can ask yourself, what's the frequency, depth, and duration of this issue? You know, if we go back to the idea of a headache, how often do you get your headaches? How long do your headaches last? How deep into your skull do you feel like they go? So you can use the stress response system to treat somebody surviving with trauma or somebody dealing with a headache or just generalized stress and anxiety. It's a really safe tool to be able to plug in and, and move forward with. So now we're going to go on to the two posters. Uh, poster one is, I took the poster and put it in half so that it fit on this slide, uh, but you'll see it once you open it up. So our goal with creating this poster was a couple of things. I had been looking at what the VA used and other mental health counselors used and what other institutions used as far as a different scales regarding pain and sleep disruption and stress and anxiety. So I decided to just smash them all together and come up with something that allowed me to have conversations with my patients about where they're at and what their experience is like in their body. Okay, so this particular poster, um, we use the word pain. So we'll talk in terms of pain as we go through this poster, but recognize that you could also use this poster and switch the word pain for stress. You can switch the word pain for anxiety. Basically, this is a way to help you connect your patients to their experience in their body. And at the same time, giving them more ways to live their life outside of a narrow window of everything I feel is pain, everything I experience is anxiety, everything in my life is always stress. Okay, so we'll kind of go in. So if you look to the left side of the poster, there's a dashed line. <clears throat> and if you follow it, it says the line between pain and sensation and pain. Now, that is in place. Because not everything our population experiences is pain. Pain is pain, and I'm not going to take anybody's pain away from them. But what I want to do using this poster is help explain to them and help connect to, they have a lot of sensations that happen in their body that aren't pain. And if we can help them recognize that, then their body doesn't have to respond to that pain stimulus every single time they experience something. So what does that do? That gives them way more resources and way more things that they can experience before their body goes to that sympathetic response of we have to handle this, we have to find safety, we have to escape, we have to evade, oh my gosh, it's upon us, we've got to freeze up, we got to lock up, or we're just overwhelmed and we shut it down. So the line between pain and sensation is that line between red and orange. Now things can be very sensationful, right? They can be uncomfortable. They can experience discomfort at different levels, right? But what we want to try and do is help our patients understand that there are more things they can experience in their body than just pain. And when they do that, they're going to get a lot more livability back in their life. And that's our goal. So it might be something where you hand them a thesaurus or you jot down a handful of words that they use a lot during their session and ask them to find other words, right? The way that... The way this stays in the manual therapy, massage, and bodywork field is as they use these different words in future sessions that aren't pain, you're going to notice the tissue under your hands and your treatment responds differently to their headspace. So this is the brain-body connection 
conversation through the nervous system. Okay, so you can have them, you can let them use the colors, you can let them use the faces, you can give them these words and help them understand the difference between what is and what isn't, um, what is, like how do they feel at the end of the session compared to how they feel at the beginning of the session and just kind of note some of the words that they use to empower them to take those next steps towards their next piece of wellness, towards their next step in healing. Right. That's our goal is to try and help them understand that. So before you take this poster and you put it into practice, I want you to sit down with the poster and look at it and go, what is that line between pain and sensation for you? Or what is that level between stress and anxiety? Whatever, whatever word you want to battle with, whatever word you want to go to work on, put it in place and do your own homework. Because the more familiar you are with how did this process works for you, then you can go and share it with your people and help them understand what it's going to do for them. So put it into place for yourself, and then you can help others. Okay. So the autonomic nervous system poster, poster number two, uh, this is the one I specifically created to help people dealing with PTSD and unchecked anxiety and stress and depression. Like this poster was created specifically with them in mind, uh, but it's also really, really effective for everybody else. So there are two different ways to break down this poster. There's the anatomical and physiological impact of stress on the body. And then there is the real life examples of stress's impact. Okay. So the top part is the anatomical and physiological impact. The bottom part is the real life. So the reason that we want to go through both pieces, left side and right side, is so that we can help our patients connect to the changes that are going to happen as a result of your therapy. So we can't come into a session telling our patient, well, we're going to do this treatment, we're going to do this massage, we're going to do this craniosacral, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, and your digestion is going to get better. Right. I don't want you to put it into that space. I want you to say, we're going to do this treatment. And then I want you to pay attention to what changes in your body after our session, because then that empowers them. Again, this is about that trauma informed headpiece. It empowers them to be a proactive member in their healing process, because if they're not going to be proactive in their healing process, I'm not going to keep them as a patient. Because I can't help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves. And neither can you. So use that as you see fit, but that's my perspective. Okay. So we're going to talk about the top part first, which is the anatomical and physiological chunk of the poster. So when I sit down with somebody, I will literally sit them on the stool in front of the poster here in my treatment room, and we'll go through the stress response. So that stress response could be, did somebody cut you off in traffic? That stress response could be, are you having issues in your relationships? That stress response could be a saber tooth tiger's coming to attack you. Hopefully that's not the one, because otherwise we need to talk about your timing and, his, and the history of the planet. Uh, but you kind of get what I'm saying. So that, that stress response system is reptilian. It is old. It is primal. It is specifically there to keep us safe. So when we get, when we incur increasing levels of stress, it's going to dilate our pupils so that we can see what's going on in front of us. Sometimes it dilates it to the point where we're going to end up with tunnel vision. And then other times people can't see what's right in front of them because all they have is peripheral vision. Okay. So if you notice that when, if your patients, when they get stressed out or when you get stressed out, your vision gets a little blurry begins to change, that's letting you know the stress response is impacting your eyes. Okay, so the next one is the inhibition of saliva. When we get stressed out, our mouth goes dry. So anytime somebody gets involved with public speaking, a lot of times it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta go up on stage, <sighs> the Sahara Desert shows up, right? So in yourself and in your patient load, this might be something that they may not think of or have thought about, but maybe they're constantly needing to chew gum, right? Or the constant drinking 
of things, right? Or maybe halitosis and bad breath, right? These are all signs and symptoms of that stress response system's impact on salivation. So then we get a relaxation of the airways so that our body can improve O2 exchange. You know, when you think about the amount of surface area in our lungs, the same size as a tennis court, that kind of lets you know that's a pretty good amount of space, right? So that change in breathing becomes an issue. So people may shift to shallow breathing or hyperventilation when they get overwhelmed. So this is where we have seen, you know, science has shown us that meditation and purposeful breathing can help us downregulate and come out of a stress response. So then we go to increased heartbeat. So that dial up of blood pressure, right? Just kind of, okay, stress. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? We need more blood volume. We need more oxygenated blood. So that heartbeat comes up, you get vasoconstriction through your entire body system so that you can deliver more blood faster and get more blood processed through the lungs faster, right? So the result of that is that blood volume that used to be in your viscera, in your organs, gets diverted to your circulatory system and your musculoskeletal system. So you're going to get an inhibition of stomach activity. So maybe that's lazy digestion, maybe that's poor digestion, maybe that's GERD, maybe that, you know, any of those stomach issues. What relation, what connection does your patient or you have to stress and stomach issues? Simulation of the release of glucose uh, inhibits the gallbladder, right? So when that, when that stress response stays dialed up, we're converting our body's energy into glucose so that we can burn, so that we can respond, so that we can handle what's going on. So this is the peaks and valleys, right, of that glucose cycle. But then we lose our body's ability to process what we've actually started to digest. So then the blood volume comes out of the intestines and then now you can, you're getting sluggish digestion, you're getting constipation, you're getting a nervous belly, right? Maybe you're getting uh, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, irritable bowel syndrome, like all of these different pathologies that come from a low-grade, long-lasting response, stress response, where your intestines don't ever really fully get oxygenated blood in an ecosystem in which they can function well. Because the stress response the, versus the recovery response, our sympathetic nervous system has to downregulate to a certain point before the parasympathetics even switch on. So if we, as a human, don't ever really, really reach a point of relaxation, you see how over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, these simple responses to the stress in your life begin to impact your body's ability to heal itself and function well and optimize homeostasis, okay? So then we move on down to the secretion of adrenaline. We need to respond, Ooh, right? That's the, the mom being able to lift the car off of their child in a, in a freak accident, right? That's that superhuman strength that shows up when, when we need it. But then over time, what happens is the body can't really maintain that that level of excitement. So then we just kind of zone out and numb out. And it leads to things like uh, adrenal fatigue and just general fatigue and malaise because we just don't have the resources to reboot the system and fire back up and go, okay? So then the stress response is gonna relax the bladder. So this is where you can have like bladder infections and, and different things based on your stress. And then we drop down to the bottom one, the promotion of ejaculation and vaginal contractions. You know, in the massage world, we kind of don't talk about this stuff because of, you know, the dark shadow in our profession is as it comes to sexual interactions, right? Whether that's the therapist or the predators on the table or, you know, whatever. Um, but when we look at this anatomically and physiologically, this is the space of conception. This is the space of relation. Um, so without ejaculation and vaginal contraction, conception becomes really, really hard. So in my years uh, of doing massage and helping, helping people uh, with, their, with their fertility issues, 
right? Helping the body to de-stress is going to improve the body's ability to get pregnant, stay pregnant, maintain pregnant. So, you know, there's a direct correlation between stress and that process for a lot of women. So when they come in, we can help them out that way. So then we shift to the other side, the recovery response. So when I talk to patients in my office and I, you know, I'm teaching classes and whatnot, I want to make sure that I'm really, really clear on, I want my people to look at this side and remember this side, because over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing treatment and I'm going to need them to be able to report back to me on what's going on, right? What what changes do they notice and where do they notice it? Because that's the body's feedback to me saying, hey, awesome. Thanks for these extra resources. This is where we put them. Okay. So constriction of the pupils. A lot of times when somebody comes off the table, you're going to see the shape of their eyes change, right? Because if, if, if they're squinty eyed, when they come in, when they come out of the treatment, they might be a little bit more round eyed. Like you might actually see more white in their eyes, right? Because that the neurobiology of trauma, as it comes undone, it's going to release those muscles around the eye. If you do massage long enough, you know, people are going to drool on your massage table when they're face down or they're going to snore, right? So that's letting you know that their body has come out of that sympathetic response and the parasympathetic response has started. So one of the things that I'll share with patients is when you're sitting down to eat, sit there and look at your food until your mouth starts to water. Okay. That's when you know your body is ready to digest the food because that saliva is going to help grease the pipes, fire up the enzymes in your stomach and help promote digestion. So keep that in mind. So when we go down into the airways, the constriction of the airways, it just basically means they don't have to work as hard. Right. So the breathing will change. So a lot of times when you're doing massage and body work, you're going to see somebody do it and they sigh. Right. It means their body is on team you as you're providing a therapy. We know that massage helps to reduce blood pressure. Well, as the body feels safe enough, it's going to slow that heartbeat down. It allows vasodilation to happen. The blood will come back out of the muscle tissue. It'll be reverted back to the stomach and the intestines and helps the gallbladder stimulate so that we can begin producing those digestive enzymes that we need to improve digestion, right? So big, big keys. So one of the things you want to share with your people is, you know, pay attention to your poop schedule, right? Because digestion is important. And if your digestion is not good and your elimination cycle is not good, chances are there's something a bit askew going on with your stress levels. Okay. And then when we get over to the contract of the bladder, it allows us a little bit more control. Uh, and then when we get down to the genitals, right, it, it promotes erection of the genitals. So this is where the conversation of the blue pill comes in for, for the men um, and even for women, you know, the, the issue with women not being able to achieve orgasm. In a lot of relationships, that leads to a lot of other types of breakdown. And a lot of times it's just stress related, right? Eliminate stress as much as you can and your body will do what it's designed to do and it's designed to heal itself. So a lot of times when I'm going through this poster, based on the person I'm talking to, I'll start with, as I go through, I want you to just kind of pay attention to what jumps off the poster at you. And then when we get done, we'll have a little chat about what, what showed up for you as I went through the anatomy, okay? So sometimes people are going to plug in and be like, oh, yep, yep, yep. Like you just highlighted everything in my body. I've never seen it all happen where it got all explained at one time. Everything makes sense to me, okay? When you sit down and you go through the poster with people, you're going to hear that a lot because most, well, you're just going to hear that a lot. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Now, if I'm going through the poster and I recognize the person that I'm talking to really isn't plugging into the anatomy because they might not know their body, they might feel uncomfortable paying attention to their body. Um, and sometimes they're just going to be numb to the whole thing. They just don't care. Right. It's not that they don't care. It's they just don't, they don't feel safe enough to look inside. 
okay, that interoception piece. So if that's the case, then I go to the bottom of the poster, which is here. Okay, so when we talk about the poster and we're at the bottom half of it, I always start with the right-hand side because we're talking about the stress response side. So most everybody understands that the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. But I like to add a couple other things, you know, as I, in my mind, I'm taking this discussion from black and white to 4K TVs that we have today because there's more responses that happen in the body and they're not mutually exclusive, right? So when we get stressed out, sometimes we're just going to dig our heels in and we're going to fight, right? Sometimes stress, stressful situations, we're like, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm out of here. Other times we don't know what to do and we lock up, right? Literally the deer in headlights. Okay. And then the full response, you know, if the possum feels overwhelmed, it plays dead. Thinking that if whatever predator is coming after me thinks I'm already dead, they're not going to mess with me. Humans were a little bit more complex. So for me, the full response is also similar to the fawn response, where we mirror the environment that we're in as to not make any kind of waves. Uh, for me, this is also people who put on a mask or put on an identity or try to make light of situations or use self-deprecating humor to try and like diffuse a situation, right? The court jester, if you will. Um, and sometimes that full response is us fooling ourselves. Okay. Um, the fate response just basically means that the stress level is too much. It's overwhelming to the point where we check out, right? Our brain gets put on pause, the recording of what's going on around us gets put on pause, and all of our body's resources go back to just keep the heart beating and blood flowing. Just keep the heart beating and blood flowing. This is why people who have gone through traumatic events oftentimes can't recall certain details because at that point in time, the brain just stopped recording. Okay. So what I want to encourage you to do before you take this to your patients is sit with this fight, flight, freeze, full, faint response and see how you respond to different stressful situations in your life. What is your pattern, right? Because these aren't mutually exclusive. It's not one or the other. A lot of times our stress response is going to be, we start with one, then we slide into another, then we slide into another, and that's where we just kind of stay. Okay, so pay attention to what happens you know so a lot of times with uh with stressful situations <clears throat> i will start in a fight response and then i will move to a freeze response and then i will move to a full response so like i will battle the situation going on in front of me then i'm going to freeze and say oh my gosh did i just overreact and then i might fool myself into thinking my my reaction to that stressful situation was fine but it wasn't and it just sits in the back of me and just gnaws and gnaws and gnaws, right? That's one of the processes that I've recognized in my life. So just to kind of give you guys an example of you, you want to be able to work through this and look at yourself with kindness and try and figure out how you work. Because as you level up, you're going to optimize how you respond to stress. And then you're going to find yourself in stressful situations, not having that level of overwhelm, right? Yes, you might, you might get overwhelmed but you don't stay there. You can recover, right? That's the resiliency piece. You can handle it and recover. And as you recover, that's where we hit the left side of this piece of the poster is that rest, digest, repair, rebuild. That's your parasympathetic side, right? So on that parasympathetic side, the first one is rest. Now, it doesn't say sleep. It says rest. Rest and sleep are not the same thing, right? Because a lot of people can go and have an eight hour sleep overnight and wake up not feeling rested. And then other people can sit down for a five minute nap, wake up and go finish a marathon. Okay. So this is where the idea of team siesta comes in. Like I'm totally on board with naps, right? Because I do have issues with insomnia and the nights where I don't sleep well because my brain turns on at like three o'clock in the morning. It's like, hey, guess what? We're at full speed for the day. 
I'll find space in my day to just lay down on my massage table or, you know, a couch, or even if I'm just sitting in my car in a parking lot, just, just kind of turn my brain off for five or 10 minutes. I know the strategic value of rest in my body. So that's what I will offer to my patients is if, you know, you're, if you know, you're going to have a stressful day, make time to rest, you know, turn your computer off put your phone down, right? Put a timer on your phone and just close your eyes for 10 or 15 minutes. Rest, just slow down, okay? Then we move on to digest. As I mentioned previously, when we're stressed out, our digestion's not good. So we wanna begin having that conversation or are we eating for fuel or are we eating for mouth pleasure? Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. Okay, so one of the things that gets better as we spend more time in that parasympathetic side is digestion. Okay, so being mindful of what you're eating, when you're eating it, how does your body respond to what you've eaten? These are things that you have to do for yourself before you can help your clients, before you can help your patients, right? Because we, unless you have a degree or certification in nutrition. We can't do nutritional consulting, but we can share our experience with our patients and help them understand this is what you can pay attention to. Okay, makes sense? So then we go down to repair and rebuild and man, this is our wheelhouse. Like this is where massage therapy comes in at deafening levels of awesomeness because when people come out of that protection mode that guarding mode then our body will take that those minerals and those resources because our digestion is better and it's going to send it to the parts of the body that need it so by getting massage and by getting body work we're helping the body feel changes in real time so that it can be supported as it grows through that process okay and as far as rebuilding like Stress isn't always bad, right? Sometimes you stress, the good type of stress can be good. So encouraging people to start taking care of themselves. You know, maybe one less soda, one less pop a day. Maybe instead of just letting your dog out in the backyard, maybe you take your dog for a walk, you know, go for a walk, you know, do, take the stairs, just whatever it is for you, for you personally, again, start with you. And then whatever it is for your people right? Help them help themselves by empowering their courage to take those steps, okay? Because as they spend more time and gain more familiarity in that recovery response, they're going to begin understanding, oh man, I can really handle this stressful situation. And then I've got the tools to downregulate, right? That's amazing to give to our people. But know that and share with your people that, hey, I know it's not perfect. Yes, this is a marathon, not a sprint. But you know what? When you hit those periods of overwhelm, where you hit those periods where your, your chronic pain shows back up, you've got a phone number you can call. And you've got a person, you've got an ally in your corner that's got the skill set to be able to help you. And by going through the poster that you just went through, and by going through the client response poster, they understand that you understand how they work. And that kind of connection is going to make you an even greater expert in your area so that you can work smarter, not harder, help empower your people, help them recover, help them learn their body. Man, that's just, that's the magic stuff, isn't it? So those are the two posters. That's the sharing that we had. Uh, if you have any questions after watching this, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I welcome any feedback, anything that you want to share. I uh, look forward to seeing you guys in April. And uh, yeah, take care. We'll see you soon.